Hey, hi to everybody. So, uh, please welcome our next uh, speaker is Chris Bettert. Hi, Chris. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can. Okay, cool, cool. And also here our technical expert. It's uh, Dmitry Chuikov. Chuiko, sorry. Dmitry, can you yeah. hear us? Alexander. Hi, Chris. Okay, that's good, that's good. Everyone. So, first thing first, uh, Dmitry, uh, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Dmitry Chuiko. Uh, I'm actually a guy from the Java world, mostly. Uh, but also, uh, Java world is now tightly intersects uh, the world of containers and everything else. So uh, I work in a company named Bellsoft and uh, we do a lot of optimizations and other work in OpenJDK. So you can see my talks on uh, Joker and JPoint, but I also like DevOps stuff. <laughs> yes, and now um, you are on our track as a technical expert. It's new role in your life, as I see. Uh, yeah, first time. Okay. Everyone. So uh, maybe you also have a couple of words about the Chris talk, which you want to tell us before we will start? Uh, yeah, as you noticed, uh, here we have Chris from Belgium. Chris Tired uh, is a long time uh, Linux and open source consultant. And uh, you can see it uh, right on your screen, <laughs> I guess. And today Chris strongly motivate us, motivates us to create uh, more reliable solutions as Chris is also a well-known DevOps enthusiast, sharing his work and uh, experience uh, at conferences like DevOps here. Uh, please ask your questions uh, in Telegram chat. That you can find it, uh, the link right here. Uh, and welcome, Chris. Yes, welcome, Chris. So let's switch to your topic, to your talk. OK, let's go. So. We're ready to go? Yes, yes, please. OK. Um, good morning from uh, Antwerp, Belgium. Um, my talk is going to be culture talk. And it's uh, going to show you a bit about how we got here, what happened over the past 10, 15 years, actually even longer. Um, but let's start with who I am. Um, I used to be a developer 20 years ago when I started my career, um, even did some Java work ages ago. Don't ask me to write Java now, that's way too long ago. But at some point, I became the person who was capable of doing the operations part of that whole infrastructure. I was the one who was racking machines, I was the one who was clustering machines, I was the one who was basically keeping things up and running. And fr from that experience, uh, about 13 years ago, I co-founded Inuit, which is one of the uh, larger some people call it a boutique open source consultancy shop in Europe. We have offices in uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, Czech Republic, Poland, and uh, Ukraine. But I also started organizing conferences such as DevOps Days, together with Patrick, Convict Management Camp, uh, together with Toshan, and, and a couple of smaller ones. And who knows, even in the future, uh, we'll have a delivery conf in Europe. So while doing that, while talking about what DevOps is how we did open source infrastructure automation and all those things. We ran into things like typical enterprise software deployment. Like most enterprises, if they are delivering software, they are basically in a mindset where somebody at a Friday evening at five o'clock walks into an office where there are some people who manage the things and they say, hey, Here's this tarball. Can you put this live in production now? Because we have something happening on live radio, live TV in half an hour, and we want people to be able to see this. And um, I've not had that happen once, but multiple times in my career. Um, and, and a typical response at that moment is, well, wait, how, how do we think we're going to deploy this? We don't have machines for this. Do you need a database? How about security? How many people do you expect here? And, and eventually you come down with, to, but you know what? I, I, my computer cannot install this. I mean, you gave me a Windows binary and we're 100% Linux shop. And it, it basically came down to the mentality where this meme started happening, where developers say, it works on my machine, it's an ops problem now. And that's what we call DevOps back in 2009. And that fundamental problem is one we, we've been trying to solve for ages, because it's not just the developer 
not talking to the operations. It's basically an organizational problem into most organizations where there's a lack of communication and where there's actually operations and then monitoring and then security is typically just an afterthought. People just look at functionality. So when we look at what happened over the past big decade is that we saw a movement coming out of the grassroots where people started talking about DevOps. And if we, if we want to have a definition of what DevOps is, we quickly end up with the CAMS keyword uh, coming out of Damon Edwards and John Willis's podcast, where we talk about four key components, and that is culture, culture of an organization, how they behave. It's about automation. It's about automate everything, infrastructure as code, monitoring, metrics, security automation, all of those things build automation. It's about monitoring and measurement. And it, it is about sharing both experiences, pain, and source code, and also about security. And, and those different components are what, for a lot of people, defines what DevOps is really about. And, and to me, the best definition is basically that DevOps is a global movement to improve the quality of software delivery, which we started back in Ghent in 2009, which is based, started out of the crossroads of open source experience. People were doing agile and people who were experimenting back then already with cloud adoption. So how do we get there? Um, in, in order to see what we're doing wrong today, we, we need to go into history and we need to look at what we've done before and, and why we basically end up here. And I'm gonna go back to about two decades ago, uh, a bit less, um, when I was one of the persons active in the Open Mosaics project, which was an open source um, Linux kernel program. And what we were trying to do back then is we were trying to do high performance computing by taking a process, splitting that process in two and sending parts of that process to different nodes in our clusters, letting those nodes do the calculations and then get the data back. So parts of our processes were migrated to other nodes and we were orchestrating how that would work. We were having definitions of, well, I need this access to files. We need at least that kind of CPU. And we were kind of doing this. And, and it was really something that was allowing some people to, to do high performance computing. We had a file system in there called Open Mosaic File System. And that actually allowed us to have a unique view of all the data over all parts of the cluster. But it had some limitations. Um, some of the things were that once an application had shared memory, it didn't actually work. We couldn't actually migrate those processes. We had some patches there, but it didn't really solve most of the problems. And that, that file system access in the middle, that open mosaic file system was actually uh, pretty unstable. And I think one of my biggest contributions back then was to actually remove that from the whole kernel base. So back in those days, my lessons from, from that experience was like, if you want to have a distributed application, it's going to need to be slightly adapted for it to be able to work. Um, we're going to need to have access to the data. And there's not going to be a one size fits all solution, which you're going to take and just drop in there. And without any change from the applications or the behavior of the organization, things are just going to work that there was a huge gap between the people that wrote the actual kernel code and the people who were saying, hey, I'm just going to run my Postgres on this because it's going to work, and application developers. But there was definitely, for a certain set of use cases, this worked, and it was a really good tool. So some years later, I um, wasn't doing that much high performance computing anymore. I was doing more high availability, scalability, more redundant applications. And we were working with an ecosystem like Heartbeat, Heartbeat version two, Pacemaker, Corsync, and a whole ecosystem there where we weren't shipping off processes to different nodes, but we were defining a number of resources, OCF resources, where we said, this is a database, this is a web server, these are resources I want to run. And we were defining constraint, like I want five clones of that web server and the clones of the IP addresses. And I want the IP address to be co-located with the database, or I want the IP address to be, or the database to be co-located with the storage. And I also don't want 
for example, the database to be co-located with a web server. And we were, again, orchestrating services and running services next to each other based on demands. Um, we had really complex architectures here. Like there was even 20 different components in there, which I'm not going to bore you with, but it was really back then complex. Lots of people were struggling with how these things work. And we called the whole stack and people who knew how that stack worked. That was the complexity basically giving us a consulting opportunity. What we learned here with applications did that we needed to work tightly together with developers because some applications had state, some applications were stateless, the minority. But most applications were not even aware they were storing state somewhere. They had like this local file somewhere, something in slash temp. And once there were multiple instances of that application, people started to realize like, hey, if I have this on another node, I cannot access it anymore. How do I deal with this? How do I work with this? So we needed to start talking about how to deal with local file systems versus how to deal with distributed file systems. The other thing we needed to figure out is, hey, if I'm having a service and I want that to be up and running, I need to know about its health. I need to know if it's actually working. So we agreed with developers that, hey, you need to publish some kind of health page, something where I can go and check and say, hey, is this thing still on? Is this thing working? So they started creating health pages. Um, and rather than just checking if the Java process was still running or the port was still open, we started to query those help pages to have more redundant systems. We also wanted metrics. We wanted to know if the application was still performing, if it was actually processing things the way it should do. And in improving those clusters and improving those applications so they could become high available the way we wanted them, we learned that there always was the step to have that conversation between both sides of the wall, between the people who wrote the code and the people who were actually managing the codes and deploying it. We improved. We started doing things like we have only one application per VM, which is really easy to configure. There's no trade changes. And when we were doing that in early 2000s, people were calling us crazy because you're not going to just spin up one machine for one service, right? You're just going to do it, use it for all. And then we added multiple machines that had similar functionalities. We called them A, B. We called them 1, 2, 265, whatever. And we learned to do infrastructure as code. We learned to isolate the actual code from configuration so that we could basically spread that configuration over multiple nodes. And slowly, our communities improved into doing things like infrastructure as code by default and actually versioning things. And, not having fine crafted snowflakes where nobody knew what was working and nobody knew how we ended up there. We didn't have image brawl. We could really build something from source. So by doing that, by improving all of this, we, we had to discuss where do you store configuration? You had to work with developers. You had to work with your colleagues on to slowly adapting a number of these applications so they didn't have access to the shared file systems anymore, to the local file system anymore, but sure. We needed to have discussions on how to do monitoring. And we, we learned that if we collaborated, things were going to improve. We also learned that if we were doing this with open source tools, it was 10 times as easy as trying to even get to that level with proprietary software. So some years later, the cloud becomes popular for some people. Um, we saw that people wanted, organizations wanted to have that same thing. And they started doing things like private clouds. And what they did wrong there is they, they forgot about everything we learned before. They didn't add the monitoring correctly. They didn't infrastructure as code. They literally, in a lot of cases, just took whatever they had in their data center shifted it up and dropped it somewhere in a cloud and didn't change the way they behaved. They were still doing old school, traditional deployments. And the developers weren't happy with that. The developers were still stuck for a long time with IT departments that didn't adapt. And that basically when they needed something, they went, I need a VM to do something. And the IT department would go, yeah, sure. Here's like four forms. Please fill them in, wait five weeks and then get something you totally don't need. Uh, and then they repeated the process. Whereas on the other side, what they wanted from cloud was 
agility, flexibility, and spin up a VM somewhere, do things, pay the amount they needed to pay because they were using it. And now they were stuck. They were stuck in traditional IT. They were not capable of doing things dynamically. So the whole conversation between the developers and the operations people where the operations people like, we want more resilience together with you. And the developers said, yeah, but give me the machines that didn't work. Some teams made huge advance into actually having developers use similar stacks, identical stacks to what they were using in production. They were doing infrastructure as code. They were doing uh, full automation. But those legacy IT departments, they never adapted. And, and in a way, when we look back, those were probably and are still are probably the majority. So a bit further in, in, in time, there was this new hype. I mean, we were doing Puppet, Chef, Sea of Engine, and all this kind of automation. We were doing Vagrant to spin up things. But suddenly, this Docker thing happened. And, and a, a bunch of us were like, what, what's this? I mean, we're, we've been doing containers for, for years. Vagrant LXC is just a nice way to spin up a container. Um, OK, it's not the same ease of use as this new tool, but a lot of us were struggling. And then marketing people were, this is the ultimate DevOps tool, not understanding that DevOps is not about tooling. And we saw a, a growth in that ecosystem where a lot of people were just jumping on it and adopting it. And we had people talking about conferences with just this slide, Docker, 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 Docker. Everybody was talking about Docker, 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 Docker. And they were focusing on this is the new DevOps tool. This is going to solve all of your problems. And we saw things like people taking their legacy application, their monolith, and shoving it in a container. We were basically having the same discussions over and over again. The adoption of that container ecosystem, what technology was really good was being blocked by people not understanding what they were doing. One of, one of my earliest memories of having a customer who was having problems with his Docker adoptions was a CIO who called me in and said, well, we're doing this thing with this Docker ecosystem. And I was giving a demo for my Miami-based customer. And right before the demo, I just restarted everything. And when I tried to start it again, all of my data was gone. And I sat there and looked at him. It's like, so what's the problem? He said, all of my data was gone. I said, yeah, but that's actually how it's designed. It's supposed to be stateless, short-lived. And he didn't realize that. They were using a tool which they didn't understand. I ended up realizing that this is what the average enterprise containers looked like. It is that just they were reusing it as a VM. It was no different from what they were asking from a typical VM provider. It was a full rel image. It had SSH running in there. They were actually running Oracle or DB2 in there. There was a queuing system in there. Some stacks, some layers extra, the actual application. And then they had ages in there for monitoring, for backups, for all of those things. And I thought this is an anomaly. This is an exception. And the reason why they were doing this is because their old traditional IT department hadn't adapted. They were still charging a lot of money to spin up a VM once to keep that running a month. And if they wanted to restart it or a new one, it was the new cost and it was expensive. So they figured out that if they would ask their IT department for a big, fat machine and then run containers in there and treat those containers as smaller VMs, they had a problem solved. Obviously, they didn't. So the reason why they started containers was not because they saw the benefits of it, not because of the isolation, not because of potential other reasons, but because their IT departments didn't adapt. On the other side, the IT department saw this coming and they said, like, where is this coming from? What, what, 
What have you built? Where, who installed this? Who has maintained this? Who's updating this image? And they went like, this is not the way to go. We are going to do something wrong here. So it wasn't long since the new way of working for these people was like, here's a container. Now put this in production. And obviously then the response of even organizations that had fully automated everything, obviously organizations that had monitoring and metrics under control was like, sure, but we have a pipeline which is capable of deploying any type of application that you typically build internally, go to the whole CI cycle and it's going to be deployed automatically. Why do you bring me a container now? We haven't discussed this yet. We haven't prepared anything for this. We, we don't have a container ecosystem. We don't have machines for that. Why are you storing your data inside of that container? What about security? When's this image been updated? Wait, wait again, which distribution are you using? How are we going to monitor this? How are we going to do backups? How did you build this? And the response from the developers basically was that, no, it works in my container. Your problem now. And we went from developers throwing small packages over the, over the wall of confusion to developers now throwing huge containers over the wall of confusion. And a small package, you can catch it, but a huge container, like you can see, it's going to hurt. So we ended up having to close the gap between developers and operations again. We, we needed to teach people again that we need things like reproducibility. We need things like monitoring. We need things like security and backups. Like, how do you build this container? What is it coming from? Are you just pulling random things from the internet? Are you going to be sure that the things on the internet are still going to be around? Or do you build this from local repositories? And we needed to start discussing again with them, like, what are you using a container for this time? And also the discussions like, how do you build the hosts that run the containers? Or is your business capable of outsourcing this and consuming it somewhere else? Because that's not something which everybody can do. So once again, the, the, the discussion on doing infrastructure as code, doing monitoring, doing metrics was hot again. Now only the difference was this time we were moving a process to a container. And we started improving again there. Things were slowly improving. Things were slowly getting better. And then this new hype pops up. We're going to do this on a distributed platform, and we're going to have this magic tool that solves everything, orchestrate it, and, and solve all the problems you have. Because there is a small difference between, like Michael Ducci describes here, having a container on your local machine and then developing on it and then putting it in production. It's not just the one layer additionally. It is the orchestration engine. It is how you do rolling deployment. It's about monitoring. It's about the networking. It's about configuration changes in there. It's about discovery. It's about so many things that if you just run them locally in your container, it's not going to be the same. So 10 days into operations, this is what happens to your container ecosystem. And there's a variety of failed Kubernetes stories out there. Um, the, the amount of vendors that come in with a shiny story, like, hey, here's a perfect workflow. And if you just commit your code here, it's going to be deployed there, which typically doesn't fit the actual workflow that organization has been working on for years. And it also comes with oh, yeah, but you haven't storage yet. Yeah, well, you need to put storage in place or you need to do this and this. And I've seen multiple customers who try to deploy a Kubernetes-style environment in their own data centers. And after a couple of months, realized either that it was way too complex to do this or that the applications, and those were actually the smarter ones, the applications they were trying to deploy were not suitable yet for containerization. They also weren't suitable yet to be deployed in a public cloud, but they thought they could jump that step and they thought they could put things straight into containers. The other style of stories is people be completely ignored security. Like, now nah, we just have everything running as root and we let containers run that way uh, because it's too complex to set up the other way. And sadly, 
those were at some point even the majority of the stories we had. Agreed, I'm a consultant, I'm being pulled into organizations when they're really having problems. But you want to see those shiny, it actually works stories also. And I haven't seen that many of them. So 11 days into operations, the ship is really sinking. Typically, security is a problem, but also the fact that deployment now is more complex, more problematic than before, is often one of the issues. What happens in a lot of setups is that the way people are now deploying things and the way people are now dealing with operations is that they build a new silo. They've had a large organization where somewhere in a corner, they're now building a container ecosystem. It's the new container operation team. And there's two ways into doing that. It's either completely the junior people will want to jump on the fancy new technology and will build something that works, kind of, but is ignoring 20 years of best practices. Um, I mean, who cares about security anyhow? And it's going to be shiny and it's going to be fancy, but it's going to be insecure, unmanageable, not upgradable, like the typical demo effect. Or the opposite is where there's a team which is really going to focus on building this, um, just says, we're going to hide for 18 months, we're going to build this, and then we're going to talk to nobody. And then after the 18 months, we're going to go to our audience and say, hey, look at this, we built an awesome container ecosystem. And then everybody is going to look at them and say, yeah, that's last year's version, we're not going to be using that. And I've seen both of these things happen. None of them were actually people working together. None of them were actually people collaborating on what we want to do. And a part of these things is that the differences between development and production are huge. For a developer who is building something in a container ecosystem, he has one local machine typically, and he's working on one application. And if you're running things in production, there's a cluster because you want things to be high available. And in that cluster, it's not just that one application, it's a variety of applications. Because if it would be just for that one application, you wouldn't be needing that cluster. So things like Cube and Nomad and K3S are popping up and all having their different level of complexities. So while the developer only focuses with his application, the doesn't see the difference between how do I deploy this even. Typical things are like, when you're doing things on a clustered environment, you have potentially multiple environments, multiple versions of your application code running next to each other. When you do a deploy, you pull out a container, you pull out something, you upgrade that, you pull it back. Which for some developers is like, wait, what do you mean? There's now more than one version of my code running, which means that if somebody lands on the more recent version, the older version might not be capable of talking to the database. And they, they start to realize that these things, which they should have adapted to years ago, are absolutely not there yet. Or they're still trying to access local file systems, which they don't have, or the files that they expect to be there. Just like when we were dealing with Pacemaker, just like when we were dealing with Open Mosaics, it's not there yet. These are not new things. These are things that we've been solving for 20 plus years. But the general industry has not realized this. And in a way, also the new young people would join still need to be educated. So we end up with, it works in my container, but it doesn't work on a clustered ecosystem. It doesn't, my application still needs to be adapted. Other things is networking, for example. Your local developer might be doing something on local host port, whatever, and it's going to work in his browser. But he's not going to think about HTTPS. It's not going to think about load balancing. It's not going to think about DNS and ingress and service discovery and all of those things. And for some people, they just be able to decide, hey, we are going to run this in the public cloud. And it's all going to be taken care of. And they're going to log themselves into that vendor. But for a lot of other organizations, that is just not an option because they need to be capable of deploying something, their application 
all over the world in different ecosystems, in public clouds, in private data centers, or even in the not so traditional public clouds from different countries. So they need to rethink how they deploy. They need to rethink all of this. Things like storage. A local developer, there's nothing wrong with him having a snapshot of his database in a container, but do you really want to do that in production? Do you really want to have that storage problem? Local developers also typically don't work with the real data. And a lot of these discussions are topics that we had five to 10 years ago, or even 15 years ago, dealing with actual customer data, distributed cluster storage. Applications can do this when they are being adapted to object storage, but a lot of the local application developers don't do this yet. And then there's backups, because who needs backups on local development, right? You just mirror your code to Git and everything is happening shiny. So other topics is things like security. How do you build an image? How do you get there? The number of developers that have just taken a random image from the internet and don't understand who has built this, don't understand where it is coming from, it's huge. They just take something that built by somebody, sometimes with good intentions, sometimes with bad intentions, something that might have been obsolete by the time they take it, and they add some things to it. Whereas you want to run a business when you're running things in production, you need to think about security. You need to think about doing CI on your application and your test. You need to think about having local registries that are helping you to do these things. So development versus production is really the difference between it works locally, it works on my machine. And on the other side, how do we do all of these things? A developer who has an application working is completely different from some operational ecosystem where you have to do monitoring, where you have to do metrics, where you have to do security, where you have to do tracing and all of those things. There's a huge gap to close. And that gap is something you need to close by collaborating, by working together and by sitting together with your team and saying, hey, we want this to work. And this is what a lot of people have been saying already. Containers are not going to fix your broken culture. And I'd like to add that observability is also not going to fix your broken metrics and monitoring, which is kind of the next step there. The hard truth is that most organizations don't really have a real use case for things like Kubernetes. They jump on this hype because everybody is doing it. At least that's what they're thinking. There, in a lot of cases, is a total misfit between the application architecture they have and the application infrastructure they need. And this is often creating much more confusion than problems it's solving. When you build an application, sit down with your team, figure out what you're doing. A lot of organizations are doing this the right way. A lot of organizations are capable of doing this, but it's not because they have the same use case that fits that tool, that you have that identical use case. I mean, in a way, there's nothing wrong with having a small containerized setup just the local Docker Compose in the VM, which you can reproduce, which is infrastructure as code, which is fully automated, monitored, and managed. Or a lesser complex stack like Nomad, which does container orchestration. Good. You don't need to jump on that hype. And there's even nothing wrong with no containers at all. The goal is that you as a team, together with your management and all your stakeholders, offer a service and work together into building that service. And you should not be falling for things like cargo culting. Like, it's not because other organizations are doing this that it is the right tool for you or YOLO operations. The idea that we don't need to manage this for years and years. I mean, the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem is not building things for us to use. 
that's not their market. Their market is for an exit. So a venture capitalist is going to get a lot of money. And there's two options there. Either in six months, they're going to be acquired or in six months, they're going to bankrupt. They don't think about long-term survivability and long-term monitoring and management of those platforms. They're just going to spin things up. And if they fail, that's technical debt. And if they succeed, they need to repay that technical debt. There's also a problem with resume and conference-driven development. People are looking at new tools and say, hey, this new shiny tool, how about I start playing with it so I can get this new better paid job, even though it might not really be relevant. And people coming back from conferences and saying, hey, I heard this new shiny thing. I want to start playing with this. The biggest problem is that a lot of people still think that DevOps is about tools, and it's not. It's about changing the way you think about software delivery. It's about changing the way you collaborate with people. It really is about collaboration, about people working together into trying to work together into building better software. And containers can help you there. But if it just works on your machine or in your container, it's not really helpful. That is what we wanted to talk about today. Yes, Chris? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, great, you can hear me. Uh, I actually got uh, multiple questions, uh, so we can discuss them here uh, about the presentation and also about the things in general. Mm -hmm. Like uh, uh, one of the possible uh, initial thoughts that I see some slides about the uh, kernel issues. Uh, how often currently, uh, how is it now, uh, how often OPS problem in your practice uh, fall down into kernel issues? Okay, so back when I was hacking on the OpenMosix kernel, I was used to seeing kernel panics. I was used to having real problems. Um, up till last week, um, I didn't see any of those for a long while except for everything that was Docker related and file system related. Um, I say up to last week, because for, for some kind of weird reason, uh, we bumped into um, networking issue on uh, TCP offloading at some new hardware we got. Um, it's solved now, but that was like, I was discussing that with, with the colleagues and it's been ages since we bumped into such an issue. Um, however, once I started working Docker like five, six, seven, I don't know, remember, should look back what year it was, um, early days. The, the things we started seeing was uh, device mapper issues, file system issues, um, actually kernel panics, which we couldn't relate to. And if, if you would graph it, I would probably, while I was doing development on OpenMosic, see a lot of kernel issues, then a really long period of completely nothing. Um, and to put that to illustration, I, I've been running Linux on my desktop for 20 plus years now. So I would see a kernel panic on my desktop pretty frequently if there were real issues and the same with servers. Um, but since the introduction of Docker, that, that graph has been going up again to, to a level that honestly, I, I wouldn't even... 20 years ago, we went to Linux because of its stability and because it was a superior operating system. At, at this moment, that's not even the truth anymore for some of these cases. Um, I'm, I'm kind of fearing that sometimes quality has really decreased since the introduction of a, a number of things. And, and there's other things. It's not, it's not just Docker, but at least that was, to me, on server level, one of the things that I've seen decline really. Well, but it still doesn't look like uh, BSD will arise to the level that it was again. No, sadly no. Uh, yeah. Um, maybe like uh, uh, talk about uh, different open source uh, 
projects that you use in your practice as a tools to build uh, some solutions like what's what's the one that looks uh, most complex what causes the most pain but you still have to use that because it's a standard or it's still the best thing to apply. Um, the the one that's causing the most complexity and the most pain at, at this moment definitely is, is kubernetes and the thing is we there are choices out there um the fast life cycle of the thing and, and the fact that a lot of people would jump on it uh, don't grasp the underlying technologies. Um, they don't realize that underneath there's just things like Linux kernel C groups and a lot of IP tables. Um, and IP tables is something that for a lot of people who've been in our industry for 20 years is like the default. We know how these things work. But for a lot of the new people, They've never had to touch this before because they've never seen that kind of network stacks. Um, things that are being netted, things that are basically not working because they can't reach their network. The complexity of the networks underneath for a lot of people is completely new. They've never seen these things. So it, it is interesting to, to see how that evolves. Um, but the real question is, do you need that level of complexity? What is the benefit from doing so as opposed to using something which is also giving you what you need being distributed deployments of containers um, with a tool such as Nomad or something similar? Yeah, interesting because uh, we faced uh, like IP46 uh, issues, then uh, we fixed some scenarios for. Um, OpenJDK uh, debugging subsystem, uh, then it works uh, on Alpine uh, Linux muscle in, in a container. Um, yeah, that, that required some work uh, in the open source, in the OpenJDK itself. Uh, but for end user, it's now kind of transparent thing. It, it just works. Mm -hmm. so you say like Kubernetes is currently the, the the most probable source of so, so for the end user who's consuming this from a public cloud provider he's not going to see any of the problems the problems start when your business doesn't fit onto the public cloud um, that there's a lot of reasons there's people who have to deploy in china where not all the functionalities you have are available there's people who have to deploy in their physical data center because of legal reasons because of compliance because of everything. Some of them are good reasons, some of them are completely bad reasons, but there is a completely different world out there. And the idea that you can just use that one tool and run it everywhere, it's not there. Um, so the, the networking part is, is, is definitely an interesting topic. Um, I mean, we've been trying to get IPv6 into this world for probably over 20 years. And you could reduce the complexity of the whole networking stack onto something like a QB ecosystem or something similar by just saying, hey, we're not even going to try IPv4 internally. We're not even going to have to do all the IP6 stuff and all the things because when well, you get IPv6, what about you do something with this? Yeah, I saw that great blog post like, just let's get rid of it. We don't need uh, that uh, from a technology perspective. There have been work. a couple of blog posts posting around, yeah. floating around recently, yeah, definitely. Um, but IPv6 adoption has never happened. And we, we've been looking at it for like years, like, is this going to be the year of IPv6? And even in Belgium, public ISPs are, I mean, a lot of end user customers are hooked up to the network by IPv6, but corporate infrastructures, nope. They're internal networks. No, they're still, everything is RFC 1918 and uh, hopefully, uh, but that could have solved so many things. <laughs> Sometimes it's just handy. Yeah, we used to it, but uh, from a perspective of a machine, yeah, it's no sense. Um, and how do you think? Uh, is there still a room for proprietary software in modern technology world, like uh, say Fun Enterprise or other? Many not the entirely proprietary software, but some commercial features, something. Um, is there room? Yes. Am I a fan? No. Um, <laughs> uh, um, do, you, do you use that uh, in your projects? Uh, no. No. 
you um, stick completely to open source and that's enough and you yeah implement the and have your in-house uh, developments for for the past 20 years i've been doing only open source um i've been pretty happy with that um we have projects where we contribute to them uh for example prometheus a couple of my colleagues are contributing to that uh they're in the grafana ecosystem actually uh, but we, we've never been to a point uh, where we, we needed functionality or where we really wanted functionality that was only available in a proprietary solution, um, even to the point where if that was the case, we would switch to an alternative tool. Um, I see. So it's a kind of a position. Mm -hmm. uh, just, is, yeah, is, there a, it yeah. is there a market out there? Absolutely. Uh, but but even to me, that's, that's not really proprietary software that is people who are trying to experiment with business models uh, on to how they can grow their business uh, that that's a totally different discussion obviously because there there's so many different business models into doing things with open source yeah interesting like if we develop uh, some complex systems and you also mentioned that uh, we face uh, we have to create and program our infrastructure as a code. It mm -hmm. both happens uh, in any complex deployment from my perspective. Or if you uh, come from microservices side, it uh, arises naturally. How do you think, what's the best uh, current programming model for that? What good tools uh, we have? What probably programming languages? <laughs> Five to ten years ago, when we had to deploy something, um, if it if it was, for example, a Python or a PHP application, we would just drop some files in a directory, and it would work. And in a Java ecosystem, we would drop a jar somewhere; it would auto deploy in a GBoss or a Tomcat ecosystem. Today, even with a simple PHP or JavaScript application. You drop the files there, and then you need to do some pre-processing. You need to do this, and you need to do that, and you need to do such. And the whole deployment of an application has become much more complex. It has become tedious in a way that a lot of those steps, when you ask the developers, what is this actually doing? They go like, I don't know. Documentation says it has to be done like it. But how do you clear the cache? How does that work? What is actually being cached? And we, we constantly, for even new major releases, releases of some of those um, ecosystems, we need to figure out how they work over and over again. And they change behavior sometimes. And that is creating an additional workload and additional friction between developers and operations people, because sometimes even developers don't know yet how this works. And I've seen this trend happen into adding more and more layers of complexity, not only on the infrastructure layer, because definitely on the application stacks. Um, we've come to a point where a small web application is a couple of hundreds of megabytes of files where half of them, nah, more than half of them, the people who have built this thing really don't know why they are there. So if, if is there a good framework today? I'm struggling with a lot of them, I'm struggling with all of them. Um, do we need to get back to the basics? Do we need to get back to writing code and understanding code? I don't think we can because the world has gotten too complex and people are used to this. But we need to come to a place where the team, the service team, the, the cross-functional team that you have that is in charge of building and running the application is capable of understanding the majority of the components they're using. And that means that they need to understand within their framework how the database queries are being generated and why they are being generated like that or being capable of replacing those queries to something they really mean and that's going to help us with scalability with performance with all of those things they have to start understanding what a cache is they have to start understanding how load balancing works so that they realize that a query might end up on a different node and a lot of people just take a framework, do some small things with it, get to a point like works on my machine and the underlying things, they 
they either don't have the time because of pressure, because of things need to flow, or they don't have interest into learning these things. And that is a problem we need to solve. Nobody needs to know everything, but you need to have in, within your team enough people who understand and who want to learn how these things work together. Because if you don't, you'll end up having an application that looks nice first couple of weeks, but once there's 10 records in your database, it's going to be slow as hell. And this is not a framework specific problem. The complexity of the different frameworks is not helping us there, but it is something we as a larger community need to work on. How do these things we're using, how do they actually work? And then probably as a group, you need to choose like this one technology stack and really get to know it well, rather than switching from one technology stack to another and then next project, take another one. Because if you keep switching, you're never going to end up understanding what they all do. Yeah, we live in a world and uh, deployment can use uh, like a dozen of different APIs, but they're all different. So it's, it's interesting what can live them uh, together, but still, uh, I don't see such a tool. So it's, it's an open question. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, how do you think uh, what's currently growing? What's the most growing technology? What's the next big thing? What will replace Kubernetes <laughs> in your slides? <laughs> what will replace Kubernetes? Yeah, it, it's funny you say what will replace it in my slides. Um, <laughs> yes. I, I rant a bit about Docker and about Kubernetes, but you could say, and I think uh, John Topper a couple of years ago did literally the same with uh, MongoDB as technology, where he, he also pointed out that it, it's not about the tool. The tool might not be ideal. The tool might not be perfect. Uh, but the, the real problem is about the way people adopt this tool and how they forget about collaboration, how they forget about, in his case back then, basic functionality like the early days of Mongo, you couldn't do backups correctly. And the developer chose a tool and it was working funny and it was working smooth. But once it was in production, it's like, how do I do a backup? Yeah, I can't. This is a feature that's only going to end up in the next release, which we're not using yet. Um, I mean, that's ages ago. But we will see that with, with every technology. Um, but which technology is going to be the next one to, to do this? Um, well, th there's so many things popping up. Um, there, you could say it's going to be serverless, uh, but on the other side, serverless, I think that boat already sailed. It never gained to the popularity level that people would have expected it to grow, uh, probably also because it is by default a vendor lock-in and not something you run in your own data center, except if you add like layers and layers of complexity. Yes, that's um, a good point. The other thing where we are going to have this hype, and I think I, I, I kind of already pitch that one Bridget slide was up where she's at and uh, lots of other people say um, containers are not going to fix your broken culture. What we see today is observability. Observability is also not going to magically fit into your infrastructure and say, hey, I can see everything now. You, you need to do orchestration. You need to actually, there, there's some instrumentation which you are going to get out of the box. But if you really want to see what's happening, you're going to have to define spans. You're going to have to work with your developers into really seeing what's happening in that ecosystem. Um, we've seen similar things to what's happening with DevOps, where 10 years ago, when we were talking about culture and open source, there were vendors popping up and saying, um, hey, we've got this legacy tool. We're going to rebrand it, and we're not going to call it the DevOps blah, blah, blah tool. And we looked at it, and we were like, but you're actually just pitching the same product, which it's really the problem product, but giving it a new name now. And, and that is literally what's happening again in the observability ecosystem now. Like every legacy monitoring and metrics tool is now saying, we're doing observability. <laughs> yeah, so, just, just yeah, a different okay. buzzword. It's just a different buzzword. So whatever is happening there in that ecosystem, I can probably, I bet I can give a talk similar like this one in two years, taking Jaeger or Zipkin and that whole ecosystem and say, hmm, it's not solving your problem because 
you haven't changed the way you deal with this. Um, I've already seen that in, in people coming to us and say, hey, we got this monitoring ecosystem, but it's not working. Um, we want shiny new observability. Like, okay, show me what you have. We've got tool X. How do you use tool X? What is your problem? Well, we've got alert fatigue. It's out of sync with reality. And people just decommission things and don't tell us. Okay, so your problem is it's not automated and you don't have a culture of keeping things green. You basically have a culture of people just ignoring each other and you decommission something and you don't update the monitoring thing. Yes. Yeah, so you, have you, have new, you want to have a new observability tool? Yeah. Fine, you want to do this with shiny new Prometheus? Sure. But what, from an organizational point of view, are you going to change so that you have automation in place, that that thing is going to be in sync with reality? And what are you going to make sure that when there's a real problem, people are not going to acknowledge it and ignore it for six weeks? And they go like, ah, oh, but we cannot change the organization. Yeah, but then taking your existing tool and replacing it with the shiny new tool while behaving exactly the same, I give you a paper in six months to a year, you're going to come back to me and say, this new tool doesn't help us. Yeah, let's take a few other buzzwords. Well, actually, the same, one or the same. Uh, try to imagine the uh, future again. Like currently, Kubernetes is a hammer for everything. And it's uh, more or less major technology. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have uh, 5G and edge computing right uh, by our door. Uh, it just is going to be everywhere. Um, I can imagine that that will merge, and uh, don't you think uh, we may uh, fall into a situation that Kubernetes is, is the legacy for ages? And at the same time, uh, we don't have solutions for a lot of uh, Coexisting problems like monitoring, backups, uh, version management for kernel deployments, uh, or DNS. It, it, it's funny you mention uh, Kubernetes becoming the legacy deployment um, in, in a way because the one earlier this week um, they announced that they're working to drop Docker as a supported platform. Um, a lot of the discussion that was happening was that the fast incremental pace and the fast release cycle of Kubernetes, which basically is forcing people to upgrade much faster than what a traditional enterprise is capable of doing then. Uh, there's no long-term support thingies. Um, it's potentially what is going to kill it. Um, it. It potentially is where organizations are gonna say, well, we're gonna stick with this release for the next four years. And that might be, the, 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 the discussion came up that that might be the real the, the last release that has docker as the default supported thing but you can still replace and um do other things because it's not that um they drop the whole ecosystem but it just the technology underneath it's changing and it, it might definitely be that you, you'll bump into a number of cube stacks that have been put there that are working and that nobody looks at anymore, which then in a way conf basically means that they end up being a security risk. They end up being huge technical debt. It, it's kind of already started in the, the way that the, the reasons why people spin up clusters is because they want to have full flexibility of all the plugins, of all the CNIs, and the different meshes they want to put on top of that, even having different CSIs that are blocking other people to not be able to use them. So they spin up now full queue clusters per team so they can have their specific configuration. Um, that's not going to scale. That's basically going to block people at some point. Yeah, so but also uh, with edge computing, like uh, we get nodes uh, that we have just uh, like a loose control of them. So the, the whole Some idea rest, uh, just works somewhere, and uh, the whole idea the, of, of something them. centralized versus something decentralized is that 
the remote clients should have some kind of own way of figuring out where they live and what they should be doing. Um, to me, edge computing is something that I see when you've got a, a cellular device and there's a lot of compute running there and that it pre-processes things so it doesn't actually have to ship things. I, I used to do a lot of work uh, in, in satellite networking ecosystems where we did things like HTTP prefetching. We did things like bandwidth optimization. And those were really devices that were on the edge somewhere. Trying to get that being part of a cluster, trying to get that being part of a bigger ecosystem, you'll have to deal with things like latency. You have to deal with things like they're going to temporarily be disconnected while they still need to be capable of running and doing things um, on their own. So for traditional IT, for typical application deployments, apart from CDNs, apart from really localized applications, I don't yet see the big advantage there. Um, it's going to be interesting for bandwidth. It's going to be interesting for um, security. But I've yet to see the, the whole edge computing benefits. I mean, maybe you have some ideas on, on where edge is really going to be interesting on, on a global scale, not on a specific telco, specific um, use case. Well, I think it, it will just contain much more devices than now. Yeah. Everything will become a computer. That's, that's the vision that uh, is promoted now. Uh, and I think we have now technical ability to reach this. But uh, it promises a lot of problems. It's uh, going to be challenging, yeah. Yeah, it's very challenging. And you mentioned uh, an interesting topic uh, of Kubernetes drop-in support for Docker. Um, how do you think, uh, is it time to, I don't know, change uh, format uh, for all the images that we produce or something? I don't hope that there, there's... Do we need to change the format of the images? I never really dug deep into the images, into the format. Uh, I think by now we have a standardized format um, that, that works for a lot of people. Um, but the, the thing with the engine being there is it needs to be something modular. It needs to be something that people can basically plug in another engine. And for, for years, we've been using Docker as the de facto standard for containers. But if you run a RHEL 8 box, it's not Docker anymore. But people still keep it calling that. And I think that is the, the other thing. We'll, we'll be talking about Docker where we actually mean Mobi or we actually mean container D. But most people won't even be seeing the difference. And underlying from a user point of view, they probably are still going to be use Docker build rather than builder, whatever. Um, so if this really going to have impact, probably not. Um, people are going to just replace the one comment with another binary, which does the same. The way we think, however, about using upstream images and where they're coming from, that is something that will be changing. Um, if I'm not mistaken, our friends from Docker have actually been uh, limiting access to their public registry. And yes, going to be... request for six hours. Oh, yeah, 200, uh, sorry. So the, the idea that you just do Docker pull and everything is going to work, yeah, we might bump into issues where that's not going to work. That You do need to think about that local registry. You do need to think about where do I publish my open source images, my 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 containers for other people to consume. Um, and that might like, have some like, like impact. Like we do, that's the question. Uh, yeah. So what do we do now? That might have impact on how you define the way to build these things. Um, a couple of the CI ecosystems have basically been integrating the image registry with their build scenario. Um, that could be doing something. Um, I, I once used to joke that uh, a Docker file is basically, we, we started from um, 
back in the early days, you wrote assembler, then you maybe move to Pascal or C. Um, and really looking at languages, um, to me at some point, C of engine was C++. Uh, Puppet was PHP or Python, and Ansible was um, Python then probably. Um, and, and Docker was going back to basic. And the only thing that was missing was the go-to statement. So, <laughs> I never really, thought of it like that, but uh, yeah, it, it really sounds uh, right. <laughs> it, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't feel at the early days to that would be the thing where I wanted to define what a system looked in. Um, obviously, the way you build a container, there, there's different ways into doing that. But that, that going back to all I'm missing is go to and a for loop. Um, but because of the, the way it looked, I don't know. For loop is OK. Just, just don't forget to make squash uh, at the end. And yeah. <laughs> that, that's the right <laughs> exit point. Yeah. Um, yeah, and getting back to that, uh, like some free tools limit their usage, uh, like uh, even in ECR, uh, you have to think about it if you pull uh, the images uh, from uh, the outside, like there's a uh, free traffic limit per month or some. Uh, and also, uh, we saw like more limits. Uh, Many people noticed a major AWS outage that impacted a lot of things all over the world. At the same time, we seem to do everything right. We have great open source tools. We have DevOps practices. But still, uh, there are things that break kind of half of the internet. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the whole fun discussion about Git by nature is a decentralized tool, but everybody is. If GitHub is down, oh, yeah, and I still don't get it. I, I still don't. A lot of our industry is just going for the easy solution. Like we just put things on AWS. That makes perfect sense. But if whole of AWS is down, or at least one region is down, I guess we, we're at the point where if whole of a region is down, um, your manager comes to you like our site isn't working. You just go like, yeah, but those guys are down. Those guys are down. Those guys are down. Like, ah, there's nothing we can do about it. Half the world is down, and that that kind of became the accepted norm. Like, if those people are really down, everybody is in the same boat. We'll have to deal with it. But it's 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 good for some online commerce. It's good for something, but. Given this whole pandemic, we, we learned that there's more important things like healthcare and hospitals and all of those things. Absolutely. I mean, I don't want to think about a world where somebody needs to have a, a medical thing happening and he cannot be helped because some public cloud is down. Um, that would be really awkward. Because if then we go like, yeah, but that online shop isn't selling, so this person, his medical needs are different. Um, so we, we, we're, we're going to need to think about those things. Right, right. And uh, another topic is that uh, many people still deploy old versions of stuff. Like Java got uh, great improvements uh, in container support and recent versions uh, that are even not so new just it happened for past few years but uh, at the same time people still do deploy old versions and they break so mm -hmm. is there any motivation how to make them switch the motivation on upgrading is in in a way there's for me mostly the biggest reason to upgrade is either there's a security issue or there's functionality I really, really want. But that's for me from a technical point of view. If you're a business person and your application is selling socks, upgrading a JVM or upgrading a Puppet infrastructure or even upgrading Kubernetes 
to you has no business value. And that is the challenge. Like, how do you map the ongoing administration work, the keeping things secure, the keeping things updated to selling a sock or selling a shoe? You can't. So there's always going to be that, why do I need to do this? Why, what's going to happen when I don't? And for, for example, I've been doing a lot of puppet work over the last 10 years. Um, but puppet as a tool, as a language, as a framework that allows me to do what I need to do was feature complete around version four. We're at version seven now. Going to a customer and saying, this is end of life, you need to upgrading this. Their answer is why? What am I gonna get? And from their point of view, they're not gonna get anything. They're just gonna get more work that needs to be done. And from a business value, they're not getting anything. So there, there's a huge ecosystem out there of people who are happily doing full automation, having things really working smooth on Puppet 3, which is ancient. But it's also, for example, a tool which is not customer facing. So even if there would be a security problem in there, an end user would never see that. It wouldn't be impacted. And with the Cube ecosystem, we're probably going to go to the same level. You're going to see things running on ancient versions because they're not customer facing. They're not end user facing. How are you going to force people to keep upgrading? You won't. Unless there's really a business value in there. And that's something really hard to translate. Maybe you have a solution for that. Uh, still uh, same to uh, answers for tech, security, and new features. Yeah. Uh, but for business, it's it's that complicated. We also have a question in chat. Uh, you mentioned that uh, we should work closer with developers, but developers tend to refuse learning all that ops stuff. What opish people can do to break this behavior? In other words, we know we should work closer to developers, but how we should do that? So one of the things that I learned over the years is that um, you don't need to only put your developers on call, but you also need to put on your product owners on call. Because what you'll have is people who don't look at the actual use of the application, at how people actually behave with the application. They go like, git commit, push what? It's five o'clock, I'm off, I'm going home. But once they see what people do with the application and how it makes their lives easier or how it improves their quality, then they'll actually start realizing like, hey, there's some value in what I'm generating. There's some feedback that I can get from understanding how these things behave. It doesn't really mean they need to learn all the tools and how to operate and how to manage these things. But that's a trick and that's a way on how to get them more interested in what's happening. I mean, if they see that things break every Friday morning at three o'clock, and if they're not on call, nobody's gonna listen to them. But once their product owners are on call or the developers are on call, they're gonna be like, hey, this is the fourth time this month. What am I gonna do about improving this? So that's like one tip to get them there. Chris, Chris, guys, sorry to interrupt you. I'm very sorry, very interesting discussion. Really, uh, this talk is very informative. Thank you for that, but unfortunately, our time is end. But I mean our time in on air is end. So I will uh, ask you just uh, go to the Zoom meeting room and continue your fantastic conversation, really. Uh, and I also ask our audience also, guys, please, Something here is Zoom link, use it and continue your talk. So Chris, uh, Dmitry, thank you to be here. Thank you for your talk. Uh, that was awesome. Hope to see, see you in the next conferences.